Hello everyone. Now, this is part two of the development of the geologic time scale around the Lake Superior area. This will be a lot shorter of a video than the introduction part because I'm not going to go through the whole thing. I will be going through just a segment of it because that first part was way too long. Now, before I get started, I want you to know, let's go to the first page here, okay, so you can look at this while I'm talking. But don't let it distract you. But I put it there. Anyway, I will not be putting this in any sort of book. There is going to be a paper about geologic time, but it's going to focus on the Precambrian. But this here will be available probably on my website, the M-I-G-E-W-E-B.org website the reason being is because there is some stuff in here that i kind of just i don't feel right making money off of because i pulled it from sources even though the sources are public and i do give people credit like you can see down here uh what's that book this that's from this book right here but so i don't want any issues with that and Plus, I just want you to have it. Also, I have added some stuff that will not be in this presentation or the subsequent episodes after because I keep finding more stuff and <laughs> adding it. So anyway, let's let's get going here. We're going to go decade by decade. Now, some decades, there's nothing that I felt was significant. So, you know, you're going to see some blank spaces. I don't know how I'm going to deal with that in the final version of this, because remember, this is a PowerPoint from a Word document that I created. So let's start with 1750 to 1760 with Giovanni Arduino. I, is that how you pronounce it? I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing it. Created a cross section through the Alps and was the first to divide the rocks into primary or primitive, secondary and tertiary. Now, tertiary, you may recognize because we still use it. <laughs> Quaternary would come later, but he never published the diagram, but he showed it to a lot of people. And this is what was weird. This is one of those cases where he must have had numerous copies going around and copied it himself or someone else did several times. And they just kept circulating it because you can tell that even this surviving one, doesn't really look like an original or it does look like an original copy my bad this one looks like an original copy or something like that so how, how can i tell well if you look at this here the diagram goes off to the edge this is the wikipedia one read this here on the right if you want see what corresponds to which i do not speak 18th century italian so you know, I can't read any of this. It's it's cursive anyway, but that's besides the point. But as you look here, you see signs that a lot of squishing was done, <laughs> if you will. And that's telltale sign that this might have been an original. See, as he goes from here, from left to right, it seems like he, you know, he, he's going here. He's got space as normal writing. And then you come down here and it gets squishier and squishier and squishier, indicating that you know, he ran out of room. He was trying to fit everything. But this diagram is really good. So I had the feeling that this probably wasn't the first take on this. But that I think all this stuff was. So I think it's safe to say from a historical perspective that this is either the original document or real close to it. So sometimes things get lost to history more often than not. But sometimes they just keep on going through history. And this is one of those documents. Anyway... The reason why I mention this is because this is a first attempt to take the rocks and assign them something based off of how they appear in the earth. And cross sections were mainly the big way to do this in the beginning of this because no one was making geologic maps then. Okay, so let's go to the next one. If you put that into a chart, it would probably look something like this. Now, why would it look like this? Let me explain this to you first. This is going to evolve into the modern geological society of America, or GSA timescale. 
So basically, I'm taking that as a template and trying to backwork it as if someone had done this in the past. No one did. In the beginning, no one even attempted anything like this. And as you're going to see later on, list. People would list things more often than try to put it in tables. Tables would, some people would attempt them, but they would come later. Now, you see up here, I have era, period, age, and MAs millions of years ago. And those are the picks. You're not going to see anything in these columns till we get closer to 1983. And actually, you're not going to see anything in these columns until we get into, the, I believe, 1925 version of this. So if, but if someone, if, if Giovanni had put like attempted a time scale this in my opinion is probably how it would have looked obviously except for this so we know the tertiary excluded the quaternary and the reason for that i'll get into in a little bit because he didn't really i don't think that part of the alps really had a lot of quaternary or he didn't think it was significant the secondary the, oh and this is where modern tertiary would be the secondary is pretty much the mesozoic you're going to see this evolve into the mesozoic now the primary is basically everything else it wasn't just the precambrian which I've heard a lot of people say it was Precambrian and the Paleozoic, but he was unaware of older rocks. I mean, there was just the mountain core itself. I think the furthest it goes back is uh, Proterozoic. So, you know, your Archean and Hadean would be in here too. So that's why this is black. So remember, just remember primary is includes the Paleozoic and the Precambrian. All right. So by 1799, people had kind of, been working off of what Giovanni did and they actually started to name some things you're going to see and this would have been the chart as it as if they had presented it now you see this is diluvium I'll get into that you're going to see a slide about that you see Jurassic appears and that's still around and the reason for that was unclear I couldn't find why Jurassic settled out so early. I can understand why Carboniferous probably did, and there's a question mark because I wasn't sure if it was this exact year or like 1801, something like that, or or even 1795. But it was it is mentioned in one of the publications, but it mentions it as if someone else had already named it. Anyway, I digress. But I could see this because coal's economical. 1799, coal was a big commodity. I could see that being broken out, them trying to figure out where that is in the rock record. And then you see we have early primary, later secondary. We have tertiary or newest floats. I... Yeah, that was a bit of a thing. Hopefully you'll see that. I, I don't think I left that slide out. But uh, we'll see here. Let's go down. Okay, 1820 to 1830. Buckland introduces diluvium. These deposits underlaying the alluvium that, and originally thought to be the result of the Noachian flood. See, they were still, you know, deluge, diluge, diluvium. See, these people weren't working against the Bible here. All right. They, they, they were trying to still incorporate it, you know, so that rhetoric of we just threw the Bible out the window never happened. We learned that it doesn't matter <laughs> as time went on, but we didn't sit there and start from that premise, despite what young earth creationists claim. Okay, the Diluvia includes the deposits that appear to be laid down by a process no longer observed. It generally referred to quaternary till deposits. Now, this is pre-understanding glacial deposits, but it would only be a few more decades before the effects of glaciers on the continents became obvious. And there's the, on that, 1829, Jules Desnoyers coined quaternary for sediments in France's Syene Basin. These would be the Syene Basins within the Paris Basin. So it's a smaller one. And that eventually would, you know, become the modern quaternary. So that's where that comes from. 1835 below, you'll see on the next slide, this publication by Provost, theoretical section of Prezium Formations, that's what it's from, no time scales attached to it, but the drawing is an early attempt on several things. It's one of the first attempts to condense a cross section into something more manageable, like a sh primitive stratigraphic column, if you will. And it shows some interesting things. Read this the rest if you want, but I'm going to talk about it looking at it. See, this, this is the beginning of what a stratigraphic column would be. 
it's a condensed cross section. It's supposed to be over the entire Paris Basin. Now, what do you notice here? This is 1835. There are unsaid standards for drawing rock symbols and stratigraphic columns. Now, you got to remember, this that was devised before anything was in color. Everything was in black and white. So how do you differentiate these units? Well, you start making symbols for them. And some of these are still around almost 200 years later. Like the brick pattern for limestone is still used. The dots. Here, let's see. I, I got the, the dots for sandstone are still used. Here's the bricks for limestone. The dots within the bricks indicate a sandy limestone. And you get more sandstone here. These little circle dots here, these are conglomerate. I believe... Oh, no, I don't. I forgot what that symbol was. Oof. I believe... Oh, this. This one. These wavy lines here, these would change. But this is mudstones. Now, for uh, mudstones or siltstone in general, we use a kind of morse code thing we long short long for slurry or for shale it's long 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 so we kind of just broke it up and some of these other things i am not familiar with i, I read up on what they were but i forget this actually is a symbol we use for under clay now in in what used to be called the coal measures i believe this is coal now we just generally use black. So, yeah, so a lot, of, a lot of things in this publication just kind of became standard without consensus. Too bad the time itself didn't. All right, 1836, the below cross section is mainly to illustrate how the terms primary, secondary, and tertiary were still being used into the 19th century. Because remember, we're coming up on what? 80 years since Giovanni originally wrote those down, and we haven't made much progress. The term alluvium was added to include modern stream and flood deposits, and that is right here. And you can see the diluvium is still used. So this doesn't have quaternary on it, even though, well, mainly because, what was it, derived the year before? Uh, 1829 so it was derived you know seven years before so you know it's it doesn't appear there but this shows you this shows you what they thought was tertiary and i don't know if this was originally in black and white or not because it looks like it was colored I think somebody else may have colored this, and this is a black and white scan. That's what I assume. So it's a little hard to read some things. But here you can see the tertiary. Here you see Jurassic, or Jurassic. So basically the tertiary is from here to the diluvium. Which, this is your chalk, okay? And this is your secondary. So this is mostly your Mesozoic, this is your Jurassic. And this would mostly be your Cretaceous, some tertiary here. And then... Uh, Let's see, I think you get down into, oh, here's your primary right here. But he added something. He added a transition. Now, in this case, the primary is pretty much the Precambrian. And, you know, this would probably be, you know, gray, wacky, clay shale. This would probably be, oh, how old is that stuff? Oh, this would have been more recent primary, but he just made them transition. That's what it was. Sorry, I had to think for a second. Okay, so I'm just going to go through the 19th century here. I'll save the 20th for later. 1837, Michigan forms its first geological survey by Douglas Houghton, who, you know, me being up on the key when all these years, I know a lot about this guy, but I didn't know how he died. He died at 36, and I also knew he was like the mayor of Detroit, but he didn't want the position. Was, the dude had a pretty interesting short life, <laughs> but um, he apparently died in a boating accident on Lake Superior near Eagle River, and I've been right by this and never knew that I was as close to where his boat had flipped over. I believe they went in October. You would think he knew better. But, you know, as a geologist, I understand when the rocks call and beckon you go. So, you know, he, he died too young and probably would have contributed a lot more than he did. But 
I don't want this to become a Douglas Houghton lecture, so we'll move on. 1840 to 49. 1840, Louis Agassiz, I believe is, I, you know, I hear people pronounce his name differently. So if I messed it up, I don't care. But this guy was cool because he was the first to come up with the idea that North America was extensively covered by an ice sheet. He thought it was at least two kilometers thick. Well, that depends on where you are. And we now know most of the ice sheets weren't that. They were 100 meters at most, maybe maybe two. There's only the core of these things that were that thick because these things are treated. So now with modern calculations, like with the Antarctic ice sheet, if it just started, if another snowflake never fell and it started melting tomorrow, it doesn't matter if it was is if it's 50 degrees or 100 degrees, but, you know, doesn't refreeze it would take a lot more than a couple thousand years to melt that so yeah i believe it's what are the calculations i could be wrong about twenty thousand. so and we know these glacial advances and retreats happen faster than that so the ice couldn't have been that thick everywhere but the thing is a lot of people what they don't understand is that this guy and darwin were friends a lot of people you know darwin evolution evolution but he was a pioneer of this as well. You know, these guys went looking out for evidence, or went out looking for evidence of a great flood, and instead they found evidence of ice ages. And that's when we started to come to the realization that mm, it doesn't look like a global flood ever happened. So Neptunism started to die pretty much around this time. The idea that rocks, all rocks, settle out of water was pretty much dead at this point. Well, in the next decade or so. But 1847-1850, David D. Owen and assistants made the first comprehensive study of the Wisconsin Lakeshore, uh, of Lake Superior. Sorry, I just stumbled over that. I got that from Thwaites. Thwaites is a, is a big name that's often forgotten in the Lake Superior region, but we'll get back to that to later. Owen came to the conclusion that the sandstones, those sandstones all around the shore of Lake Superior on the south side, were post-carboniferous. We now know those sandstones are Precambrian. This would be the modern Toronto group and Jacobsville group, okay? So he was way, way off. But around this time, too, and actually going into the early 20th century, I think about it, in some of the Greenland books, wherever there's red sandstones for a while, now this is after Owen, but everybody just right off the bat assumed it was Devonian. I don't know why this association with red sandstones and the Devonian came about, but it sure as hell didn't come out, didn't come about on this side of the pond, so it must have been in Europe somewhere. If you guys know, let me know. I just I just know that little tidbit of information. I just don't know, remember where I got it from. So here's Isle Royale for you. Those of you that don't know, it's within Lake Superior. It is the biggest island within Lake Superior. And the U it's close to Canada, but the U.S. kind of suckered Canada out of it from a mapping error. Error. Yeah, error. Sorry. 1847, the first geologic map of the Upper Peninsula was published. It was of Isle Royale. That says here. I left the E off. My bad. Although nowhere near this detailed as the modern one. There is a nice modern one. It did help to establish a basic framework that would become lithological deposits in the Mid-Continent Rift. Now, without going too much into that, for those of you that don't follow me, the Mid-Continent Rift, Lake Superior is there for different reasons other than the glaciers. It's basically where the continent tried to split 1.1 billion years ago and failed. It's a failed rift system. I don't mean an in of a triple junction. I don't just mean one little arm. I mean an entire failed rift system now it could have been partially successful we don't really know there's a floating hypothesis out there right now about that but it has problems like how do you get one amazonia out of the way fast enough but anyway i digress the point is this is the best preserved completely failed rift system on the planet and it actually goes into the subsurface all the way down to ohio in one direction and all the way down to i believe oklahoma and the other in the subsurface but it's only really exposed to minnesota the upper peninsula and wisconsin anyway not the point the point is now remember how i said earlier the americans kind of focused on 
lithology and the Europeans kind of on time. What do you see here? You see sandstone, conglomerate, and trap. Trap is basically the igneous basalt flows. They, they called them traps because that's where they would go to look for copper. Copper in the Keweenaw, that's... The world ca capital of copper is in the Keweenaw. We just don't mine it there anymore. A lot of people think it's Utah or some other place, but no. I mean, the largest piece of float copper in the world was found up in the Upper Peninsula. Anyway, so just so you know that. So this is where we get that split from time to to rock units. 1850, Foster and Whitley published Lake Superior Land District Part 1 Copper Lands with the Michigan Geological Survey. This is an early attempt, if not the first attempt, to organize the rocks of the Keweenaw Peninsula. That's the little peninsula that sticks out in the Lake Superior on top of the Upper Peninsula. I'm not talking about the east side everyone is familiar with. And, you know, that's where all the tourists go. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the west side where the real rocks are. So that part that stands up in the Lake superior that's the key went okay both native copper and iron were already known to exist in the upper peninsula copper had been known since ancient times the native americans did use it for some things we we still have the pits uh the the publication the lake superior land district part one consists of many field cross sections outcrop drawings interpretations although no attempt is made to formally name or formally correlate anything now i use the term formally loosely here because there was no standard then so how could you name something formally if there's no standard but i mean there was no attempt to really to name anything or correlate anything at all and this is just uh it's a couple of excerpts from that. You can read it if you want. They did set an early unsaid standard for generic terms, though. Even though they specifically say they're, they are generic, that will be forgotten in years, and the terms will be used with what we call time and stratigraphic units, or time stratigraphic units. I'm going to come back to this concept. I don't know in this video or a different one, because we have... When I say geochronology in these lectures about this time, I'm not talking about radiometric dating unless I say so. I'm talking about just time, geology, the development of geologic time. So I'm using it a little differently. So we'd even do that within geology. Time stratigraphic units are different, but they're not. Time stratigraphic units are things like system, which is exactly equal to a period, which is a time unit. All right, I'm just going to stop there because I don't want to get, start to confuse you. But I do know the difference, and unless you know the difference, and it took me a while to figure out what the difference actually was because no one knew. No one would tell me. I don't know anyone that actually uh, is on the committee for the North American Stratigraphic Code. So, you know, I couldn't ask any of them, although, you know, I guess I could have found them. But, you know, anyway, let's move on. It was common to use the term aqueous rocks or aqueous formations instead of sedimentary rocks. That this is something I had no idea about until I started doing the research for this. The word sedimentary was around. It does appear, but it wasn't often used. You often see the term aqueous rocks throughout the 19th century liter literature. The term igneous and metamorphic were already in use in in many surveys so you had your and they mean what they do today igneous would basically be your volcanic rocks metamorphic would be your metamorphos rocks but they seem to and during this time attach in the mid 19th century attach that more with protoliths that were igneous and sedimentary although some do mention it. it like i said it was just kind of i don't know when it started but aqueous you look here and you see ejected through vents fissures subsequently transported and here's that word pluto neptunian because neptunism was this common idea around still around mid 19th century that was dying like i said you know it's, but by the 1870s it would be out but this concept that you can that all rocks to or settled out of water was fading but maybe some rocks did came out of one we did they did you know you can get chemical precipitants you limestone can be chemically precipitated or what would become limestone evaporites like gypsum halite all that stuff but not most rocks so but they still put aqueous in there and you would see aqueous like here aqueous rocks aqueous formations 
usually associated with plastic set what we call plastic sedimentary rocks you know sandstone conglomerate shale and chemically precipitated rocks limestone you know stuff like that sorry my brain is farting right now and they would divide them out you know marine aqueous rocks or stream aqueous rock you know stuff like that and they would also divide wind blown out uh, aeolian rocks so sedimentary wasn't hardcore used we'd eventually thank goodness get rid of that nonsense but here you see it here you see base of silurian system aqueous formation now formation didn't mean what it means today in lithology and lithological classification just meant a package of rocks it didn't that's how they used it did it, it could be a, a similar concept or a modern concept of formation or it could just mean all these rocks over there so an igneous formation nearly contemporaneous now they had no idea remember at this time they had no idea how old the earth was and i think at this time no one was really still guessing they were still using like the sun or burning rates of coal or whatever to try to figure it out but honestly we wouldn't know until the early 20th century and this is from the 1849 geologic map of Keweenaw point uh Keweenaw peninsula is here and goes way up and this is Huron Mountains. You can see they drew them here. Here's Marquette. It's right about here. But you can see chlorite and jasper and trap. This is your basaltic rocks. But they also use the term trap for the Archean Plutonic rocks. That's these here. There's no mid-continent rift rock right here and right here. It's the basalts. Hmm, where do, I don't even know if they're on it. They're on the east end of Lake Superior. And they start to come up to your west, even up on the Keweenaw. But chlorite was kind of just used generically. I mean, you don't have chlorite rocks. There's rocks with chlorite, chlorite, don't get me wrong. But these are just highly deformed. This is the Marquette syncline sits. And this eventually is mostly Huronian. These are your Huronian equivalents, your Kona formation, your Mesnard, all that is in here. And now you see you have sandstone here, this yellow. This is your Mesnard. But they didn't try to figure out any structure because structural geology wasn't really a thing then. And you see that nearly contemporaneous, yet these are the core of the Canadian shield. These mostly are not. And none of these yellows are. So, you know, they still didn't get it right. But you can see they're still trying to use rock lithology as opposed to just slapping a oh, base of Silurian system. Nearly contemporaneous. I mean, they tried to split it out and map it according to rocks and not type. They didn't just map base of Silurian system. That's what the Europeans were really doing. And base of Silurian is what would eventually become the Ordovician and part of the Cambrian. Okay, the word fault had not yet come into use, although they were recognized as things as displacement fissures. <laughs> and here's, uh, you can read this here. This is what would later, in the region of Portage Lake, this is what would later become known as the Keweenaw Fault. Massive fault up down the spine of the Keweenaw Peninsula. To the left, you get the, you get uh, the mid-continent rift igneous rocks and the Toronto group to the west of it, you get the Jacobs, or to the east of it, you get the Jacobsville group, which is much younger. So I had a massive brain there. And see the chloritic rocks, chlorite zone? That was what they called the fault. Yeah, that's what they mapped it as. And see, there's chlorite rocks here, which is kind of a cheap generic way because there's a lot of complex faulting in here and folding. But like I said, overall, this is a Marquette syncline. So it was kind of used wherever they would see faults or displacement fissures they associated that with chlorite but that's not that really didn't help out in the long run and i'm not going to get into why that was a bad thing to do but it was and this here is the first cross section try to make that they tried to make of the montreal river with i and a couple montreal rivers in the upper peninsula this is the one that separates the up from wisconsin on the very west end of the Upper Peninsula. And you can see here, lithology, sandstone, conglomerate, and trap. This was this is your Portage Lake Volcanics, I believe. And this is your Oronto group. 
conglomerate and sandstone. The conglomerate and now the Copper Harbor Formation. And I believe right in here is the Nunsuch. They just didn't name it. That's the shale. Uh, and this shows how the, you know, Copper Harbor become sandier up top. I can't read that. <laughs> Never was able to. And the sandstone, this is the Frida, modern Frida. So, and down here I put the term drift was already in use at the time, although it wasn't clear the term is generically used for unconsolidated deposits. These are not unconsolidated. This is just a general statement, all right? Or actual glacial deposits, I don't know. Although Lewis had already developed the Ice Age hypothesis by this time. It doesn't mean it was in wide use. You know, there's some things that as you see things evolve, stuff appears in literature. But back then, nobody really, you know, they would just casually introduce something. And then later people would just use it, but no one would credit them. So a lot of times it's hard to see who really begins to use something and who doesn't. And that's sad in my opinion, but, you know, it is, I guess, the way it is. You know, and if we get closer to modern times, even in the 19th century, that improves. But you start to go back to the 18th and 17th century, and it's just a mess. Anyway, 1851, the Illinois State Geological Survey was founded, which to this day is still one of the largest state geological surveys in the nation. You might be like, but why? But anyway, that's a talk for another time. But it wouldn't be permanently established until 1905 and continuously running. The Illinois State Geological Survey, as most state surveys are attached to a university, and it is loosely affiliated with the university. It is its own independent thing. Then you get places like the Indiana State Geological Survey, which are completely part of the university and really have no money. And yeah, I mean, you know, I'm not going to ding the people at the Indiana State Geological Survey because it's not fa their fault. The politicians don't pay them, but they get a lot of money. So they can't really have a functioning survey. I know someone might sit there and disagree with me on that, but compared to other geological surveys, Indiana's geological survey is basically not functional as, as an actual geologic institution. Now, 1853 establishment of the Wisconsin Geological and Natural History Survey, which they have kept this name. And they get mad when you miss, if you just say Wisconsin Geological Survey, they get mad. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> but, you know, you know, whatever. I'm not, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna, <laughs> you know, argue with them on that. 1860, J. Phillips, and, and I'm giving you the names of these state surveys. You'll see why probably in the next slide or two. Phillips published Life on the Earth. This paper has many firsts, but relevant to the topic of the time, it was the first known attempt to establish a geologic time scale based on fossil strata's that they contain. Obviously, this doesn't work for the Precambrian, but we start to see familiar terms such as Paleozoic, Mesozoic, Cenozoic, Devonian, and Carboniferous. Some have different spellings from the modern, bleh, modern incarnations, but that happens in language, not to mention different languages using them. Somebody might, you know, on this side of the pond, it might be like, that's not English enough. <laughs> or on this side of the pond might even be like, oh, they named it over there in their native language. I'll just pull it over here like that, you know. So that happens. Now, I don't know if he originated any of these terms. I know for a fact he did not originate most of them. But, you know, it's the first time they're consolidated into something somewhat, you know, one place. And this is where you see it. And this is also the first time you kind of see a chart format. And you see Cretaceous. This Ulytic thing, that was, that's Jurassic, but here it's Ulytic. And that was, you know, lit Ulites, for those of you that know don't know, are something that make up rocks or parts of rocks or actually in the rocks. They're not time units. So, yeah, but then you see Triassic, Carboniferous, Devonian, Siluro, Cambrian. There's no order vision. So, you know, there was an attempt. And you can see here, this was included a lot, too. It doesn't even mess with the Precambrian. It didn't even touch it. Because remember, you know, Precambrian wasn't important to a lot of people. And actually, the time scale to this day still is very bleh when it comes to the Precambrian. But, you know, they did attempt to use life 
as a marker for these time in this paper. And, you know, today we basically use contadons to define these systems, periods, the time units. But back then they were just trying here, you know. And during the Civil War, American Civil War, abolishment of the Wisconsin Ge Geological Survey, that was from Thwaites. I took that from him. So apparently that was abolished during that time. And, uh, you know, some things came out and Americans basically stopped doing anything for those four or five years. But in 1860, if you were to put a time scale together with some of the, you know, headings I have here, this is probably how you would have done it. Quaternary, and then we have recent. That, that, the Holocene would come later, but it's basically that. Pleistocene are four Cenozoic or Tertiary units. Cenozoic started to be, and you can see it's spelled a little differently. That's not a typo. Cenozoic started to try to replace tertiary, but eventually we become separate from it. Yeah, I mean, this here they were trying to eliminate primary, secondary, and tertiary, but you know, Cenozoic or tertiary and quaternary would stay, you just couldn't get rid of them. Mesozoic or secondary and Jurassic was used by some people, just not by, by Phillips. And you can see the Ulytic was divided upper, middle, lower, and this Liassic. I still don't know what that is. And this is all adapted from Foster, 1849 and Whitney. You see the references are down there. Triassic, Cretaceous. You're starting to see familiar things, Phil things. But we still have our primary and primary continued. Lower primary, whatever. I didn't put lower primary here because I didn't see it in any of the literature. But here you have Permian, Carboniferous, Devonian, Siluro, Cambrian. You saw that there. Now here we see Huronian. The Huronian, I said this before in part one, I believe, was originally meant to be a rock time unit, I think, or a time unit. But eventually it became a lithostratigraphic supergroup of rocks, which was is more appropriate, my opinion but that would happen more during in the 70s i think i think i have that book somewhere pretty sure i do anyway i digress you can get on me here be going with my face uh you would see heronian group or not heronian group you'd see heronian period heronian age Her heronian epoch heronian series blah 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 all these different things and here is azoic which would basically become your archean vela Stay there. And your Laurentian, which is basically your lower Archean and your Hadean. Uh, these two terms are no longer used. Laurentian is still used. Laurentia, you know, proto North America. This has just faded away. So, 1870 to 1879, the Minnesota Geological Survey was established. Okay. 1873, the first comprehensive geologic map of the state of Michigan was made. 1870, and we'll come back to this in a second. 1879, Lapworth introduced the term Ordovician. And you'll see it down here, I think. No, you don't see it down here, but I'll talk about it. And he here's how he defined it, you know, just... It was born out of disagreement with further divisions. And that's one of the things you can argue in geology, you know, where you put a time division or where you want to, you know, do that, you know, at what boundary or if you want to divide another one out. That's when arguing comes because that's nomenclature, you know. This is all nomenclature. This has nothing to do with the scientific method. This is just us trying to name things. So anyway, you look here and you see Silurian, right? You see lower and upper. And here's the Azoic, but you don't see Cambrian. Now, this lower Silurian is what you call Ordovician. Now, there is Cambrian here in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. And I don't see anything in this that really correlates with it. But here's the Illinois or Michigan Basin. And here's the Keweenaw Peninsula. Here's the Archean in the Huronian Mountain. Here's Marquette. So here's Houghton Hancock. Uh, the east part is part mostly the basin as well. This is the lighter pink. This would be your Silurian, lower Silurian. This is not Archean or Azoic, I should say. And then here's that dark brown. That's big continent rift rocks. You know, dark brown and this greenish brown here. But anyway, before I just start naming everything here, the point of this map is to show you that we were mapping things 
even though there's time here, Trenton group, these are all based off lithologies. You know, the rock, Trenton's mostly carbonate rocks, right? And it's kind of how modern geologic maps are laid out. You'll put the formation or group name, whatever you want here, but now you'll put a description, usually including a thickness over here and stuff like that. At least a basic description because, you know, just having this doesn't really tell you anything. And then you'll attach time units to it if you know them. So this is kind of like the standard starting to evolve out of things. But the standard on making maps, that has been tried many times. <laughs> but we'll come back to why it fails over and over. Um, 1879, March 3rd, was the establishment of the United States Geological Survey. See, the point of me doing all those other ones was to show you it took a long time for the USGS to be assembled. Now, originally states the geology was left up to states they noticed by the end of the 19th century that this was causing a lot of confusion a lot and not just for nomenclature parts in general mapping techniques were different from state to state how people were trained in geology was different from state to state the usgs wouldn't really deal with that stuff directly but it would attempt to standardize some of this stuff and we'll see that when we get to the 20th century all right. But, you know, it took a long time <laughs> for that to be realized. And here's Lapworth, 1879. Here's his justification for, you know, getting rid of or separating out the Ordovician from the Cambrian and the Silurian, just so you know. All right, we're getting near the end stretch of this episode, 1881 or 1882. It's listed in sources differently. So, you know, it happens. We're in the 21st century, and that still happens. The first bedrock or stratigraphic column on the left and glacial geologic stratigraphic column on the right maps of Wisconsin came out. So they did two separate maps. You're going to see them. This is your bedrock map, and we still make these type of maps today. And this is your glacial or surficial map, depending on where you are, because the entire U.S. was not glacial and was not covered in glaciers. So, you know, yeah, anyway. You can see for bedrock, stratigraphy has become more important than just time. You can see these are all lithological units. Cumina. Some of these are still around today. You may recognize. Now, these are dead. Lower Heidenberg. Uh, Niagara is still used. It's not used around Lake Superior, but it is still used. Clinton. Hudson River. Galena is still used. Trenton is still used. St. Peter. Uh, lower magnesium limestone would hang around for a long time, mostly referred to in Illinois. And, uh, yeah, mostly in Illinois. Potsdam sandstone, that's pretty much west of Ohio, not used because it doesn't correlate. We know that. We've known that now for about 60, 70 years. But, you know, 130 years ago, they didn't know. Get up here. And Keweenaw, Heronian, Laurentian, you know, anyway. Now you get over here and you see drift, drift moraines. This is more geomorph. Drift is not a lithology. You know, it's, we don't use these terms as lithological units or, or descriptions even. There's no lithological descriptions here. But you can see shale, you know, limestone, limestone, sandstone. So they tried. That's this more than so than this. Okay, so these are the two maps. Here's Wisconsin. This is your Wisconsin dome or arch. Eventually it comes down to Kankakee Key Arch and comes down to Cincinnati Arch. And you can see they did cross sections. These type of state maps are still made to this day. They're just not this simple. But they were learning. They were learning. Michigan Basin's right here still. You know, here's the Bayfield Peninsula. Here's the Upper Peninsula. Keweenaw doesn't show up. Was it Menominee's over here? Escanaba stuff's over there, you know, that kind of stuff. So Madison, Wisconsin. I think here's Baraboo, but Madison, Wisconsin's down here, you know, stuff like that. So you can look at these if you want, and you can tell they started to realize that these glacial lobes started to become defined. Now, Chamberlain was a geology madman. This guy was everywhere, and he's another one not mentioned that much, at least not as far as I know. But he was instrumental. And apparently, I don't know if he maybe. Oh, did he live a long life? 
I don't know. At the very end, I'll show you. He's, I do have him at the very end. And you know what? Let's just go there. <laughs> Let's just go there. Chamberlain, how long did you live on giving you guys previews? Spoilers, 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 spoilers. Uh, let's see. Chamberlain. Uh, it, it, yeah. 18, 1843 to 1928. That is not a short lifespan, especially for then. I mean, you know, I'm trying to get the... Oh, he's born in November, so... Yeah, 18, you know, 85 is not shabby. <laughs> so, anyway, let's get back to the slides, back to where we were. <sighs> Sorry, I didn't mean to do that. I just get excited, and you guys know how I am. So, anyway, look at these if you want. Let's go on to the next one. In 1882, if a chart was compiled, it would probably have looked something like this. Notice the Cenozoic or Tertiary. Cenozoic tried to replace tertiary here, but it would come back. Quaternary or psychozoic. That is so weird. I, I, I'm not going to go into it here. I could have do an entire georant on that, if not more. It's, it's pretty interesting, but look it up if you can. And you can see what become the Holocene is basically the industrial and then glacial or Pleistocene. Uh, this seems to be in use more often than Pleistocene. See, and then they'd have tertiary or age of mammals, and that would be your age. And you can see we have the four here. Eventually, this would come into five. But anyways, but you see, and these are all used today. Cretaceous, Jurassic, Triassic, used today. Mesozoic, reptilian age. But you know what? Mammals, reptile, these don't really have any real solid meanings anymore. So there's no point. But like I said, we use contadons now. Uh, everything up and er, up until the beginning of the Cambrian. Now here you see Permian, Carboniferous, Subcarboniferous. This has basically become your Pennsylvanian, your Mississippian, uh, Devonian, Age of Fishes. That's what this would uh, be. And here's your Silurian. Let's see. Yeah, this is basically your modern Silurian. I didn't put order vision here because it was still relatively new, but that this would basically be your order vision. Upper pots dam, lower pots dam. You can just read that stuff. Here you see Huronian again. Kiwanatans introduced, and this is interesting here. Mariniskin. Now, see, and down here I talk about the order vision. You can read that if you want. And here, Azoic got restricted even more, and Eozoic was introduced. Eo is something that would disappear and not come back until recent times. That Eo prefix, I mean. That that unit never came back, that division. 1883, Geologic, or Geology of Wisconsin. Survey, 1873 to 79, Part 1 was published under the Wisconsin Survey. Chamberlain is listed as a chief geologist. I don't know if he was the sole author, but this guy published a lot. He was, a, like I said, he was a geology madman, and he published a lot of stuff. The book is remarkable, the fact of how informative it is. It not only goes through the geology with the fossils and reconstruct, and it's brilliant. And this thing is available online. It's really, this is one thing I really admire about these old timers. They were meticulous because they're still trying to figure things out. In this modern time, we've gotten sloppy with a lot of things. Stratigraphy has kind of faded away. There's not too many of us left. Stratigraphers, just kind of, you know, eh, whatever. You know, because we're starting to focus on things that we can get for through technology. You know, geochemistry, geochronology in the sense of dating, you know, that kind of thing. So a lot of this other stuff is kind of fallen by the wayside anyway. Read that if you want. And this is the first time rock classification via chemistry was tried. It would fail, ultimately. And geochemists his day still try to do this stuff, but, you know, whatever. <laughs> and mineral, even though mineralogy... Was you know, study of actual minerals was old, was around for three hundred years by this point. The term itself wasn't actually uh, coined mineralogy until eighteen thirty seven. So that's basically what was going on here. There were many different ways of classifying rocks. It was disorganized. Many of the terms aqua igneous pseudomorphic. See, this is where some of this weird stuff comes in, and the great granite controversy. 
we didn't know if granitoids were metamorphic or igneous or granites, I should say, or, or, or you know, yeah, granitoids. We'll just say that. That was a great granite controversy. We'll get into that when we get into the 20th century because that's when it was resolved, but it was already going on then. But here, look at this, igneous, those that form from molten material. We, we understand that. Metamorphic, those form from crystallization of sediments. Now, this, now Chamberlain thought they were mostly sediments, metamorphic rocks, or others argued they were igneous, but anyway, besides the point. But then you see this other stuff, aqueous, sedimentary. See, he says <laughs> sediments here, but they use aqueous through agency of water. So aqueous was used anytime water was involved, marines, streams, lacustral lakes, any of that. What basically this would become, according to Chamberlain, this would become sedimentary based off his chart. I mean, he wouldn't use it, but it would. Aqua igneous, I love this ridiculous term. Those that form from combination of action of heat and water. Aqua igneous, I should say what a crazy term because we call it hydrothermal, but that's not, hydrothermal rocks are not separate. They're generally considered uh, metamorphic or igneous depending on their origin or sedimentary, sorry, um, metamorphic or sedimentary. But it actually, it actually is more descriptive <laughs> than hydrothermal because it's like, where's the line between hydrothermal and igneous? Because I asked this, and you may, you know, because heat is involved in both of them. Water under pressure inside the earth can get up to about 300 Celsius. Quartz crystallizes from melted rock, which, you know, magma, lava, melt, which is not actually a rock, uh, at about 600 degrees centigrade. So there's only about 300 degrees there of playroom. So is hydrothermal really that separate from igneous? Is it really just, are the minerals deposited? Should we really consider them metamorphic and sedimentary? I don't know. Anyway, I digress. Pseudomorphic, those arising from metasomic changes to the constituent minerals. This is part of that great granite controversy. Pseudomorphic eventually would fail and just, you know, not be used anymore as we settle the great granite controversy. I'll just leave that hang in there for you so you watch the next episode. Aeolian, windblown, organic, you know, th these would eventually become sedimentary too. Organic, coals, that type of thing, peat. But, so your aqueous, most of your aqueous would become, but no, all of it. Yeah, all your aqueous would become sedimentary. Your aeolian would become sedimentary, and your organic would become sedimentary. And like I said, the term sedimentary is already around, but a lot of people still weren't using it. 1894, chamber, <laughs> yeah, chamber, that. And here, and just read that if you want. But this chart here, we still use this to this day. It's public domain. I, I got it from here, though, and cited down there. It's, we still, this is still put in books and lectures to this day, this day. And this would be maximal glacial extent. Now, the glaciers, each time they advanced, did not reach this level. Matter of fact, as time went on, they became less further out, but it became colder. And he did kind of recognize two cores, if you will, here and here. These, we don't think these are correct anymore. But this is where your ice would have been at its thickest. Basically here, it wouldn't have been up here. You know, it would have been down here. So, yeah. Anyway, I just think that's amazing that, you know, what is that, 130-ish years later almost, we still use this. So, that's it. I'm going to stop it there. Here's a preview for the 20th century. If you have any questions or comments, please leave them below. Okay, guys. And I hope you learned something.